Our next speaker is Maxim Topolov, CEO and creator of open source project GraphQL. Welcome, Max. Good to have you here. Thank you. Fine. Yeah. Um, um, hello yeah. from Azores Island. So it's night in the middle. It's, it's, it's full night here, but I'm here with you. Oh, nice. Thanks for taking time. And you're here to speak all about GraphQL and you call it as GraphQL Enterprise. Absolutely. Um, thank you. So let's start. Um, well, first, a little bit of introduction. Um, if you think of APIs, they are, they are absolutely everywhere inside your company, your clients, your partners. APIs are as products. You just have a presentation about the importance. We are in API days, after all. Um, APIs are in your microservices or in headless uh, because of headless architecture. Uh, and, and IoT is full of APIs, too. And if we take back a little bit of history first, well, actually, APIs is not a new hot topic. It's something that was here since many, many years. And one of the um, things is really important is that the, the change which is in the API protocols and, and different standards we have follow the changes of our usage uh, on how we build application, what is the widespread of uh, of digital in the world. So right now, uh, we see the dominance of REST APIs. It's almost every single API in the world or every single product in the world have a REST uh, API support. But uh, REST comes with a set of problems uh, that is common to, to those APIs. First of all, for example, you maybe heard of it. It's like overfetching. It's like it's very complicated. Uh, over the time to maintain um, clarity and simplicity over the data you send through your API. Um, you start with a very clear way of uh, providing your, your API and the data you provide to your consumers. And then over the course of the time, you add more and more features. The features you add, add more and more fields in your API. And that generates your overfetching. So that means when you call your REST API, you get way more data that you actually need. And it can be problematic for, for, the, for the developers who are integrating your API. Another common problem we see is that you have this kind of Cambrian explosion of number of endpoints you have to support. Um, obviously, each time you have uh, um, your developers, are your front-end developers are asking for more and more endpoints, you have to um, add more and more endpoints and maintain them with, with very small changes between them. And, uh, and finally, even if you see modern e-commerce, for example, website right now we see on the left, um, this page isn't generated by a single API call. Um, you have some reviews that are loaded through one uh, endpoint. You will load probably some recommendation and pricing from another the stock level from the third one and, and finally the e-commerce. Uh, and this multiplicity uh, generates m multiple calls to multiple endpoints. And it might be sometimes challenging to, uh, to maintain consistency and performance over these kind of pages. Uh, and finally, um, the, from my perspective, REST main problem is that it's so permissive. So everybody can do REST and everybody does REST in a certain manner. What I get from get service call is it XML, JSON, or YAML. Uh, all three are val valid from REST perspective. For sure, we have open API um, initiative, but it's very permissive and, and, and clunky up to date. This is where GraphQL comes. Uh, this is exactly the, the, all the reasons why GraphQL was created in the first place. A um, little bit of history, GraphQL was created in 2012 inside Facebook to support mobile apps and to solve the problems uh, they faced uh, through REST. And, and because of the tremendous success of this um, GraphQL standard, they released it open source in 2015. And finally, governance was entirely moved away from, GraphQL to, uh, from Facebook to GraphQL Foundation. Um, so what exactly is GraphQL? Um, it's important to think it's not just a new protocol to replace or to be aside with uh, a REST. Uh, it's really uh, a new way of thinking about 
uh, your application or your architecture. And the most important is to think about this as a graph of objects and, and models and, 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 and not just endpoints and data structures. Um, we'll get back to this a little bit later. So how it works, just a little bit of data, probably you already heard about it, but you basically describe your data using a system definition schema. Uh, you define your, your structure of uh, the structure of your API. You define your, the data structure and the object you're manipulating in a hierarchical way. And then you will ask whatever you need. It's an executable definition, what we call a query, and you get a predictable results. So when you ask for a product, uh, with the name Crocs, uh, because I love Crocs, you get a, you get a very predictable result. So you get a product and you get the name of the product. This is really important to get inside. Uh, you have this type definition. So inside the queries and the and the and them and the medias, uh, you will see that you the queries manipulate objects that are declared. It's a typed, a strongly typed um, uh, protocol. So uh, when reading a schema, you get an immediate glimpse over what is inside, what kind of uh, objects you are manipulating, and, and you can be very restrictive. You can say, I need uh, a list of media objects, or I want this particular argument to be required, or this specific field cannot be new. This is really important to describe entirely your, uh, your interface. And um, the most, maybe the most interesting first thing you will notice immediately is the relationship. When you introduce GraphQL inside your company, you will see um, a real um, uh, acceleration of the way you develop the, the application, mainly inside the relationship between backend and frontend engineers. Um, usually what happens is frontend comes, uh, oh, I will need for this UX page of my banking application, I will need accounts with um, their balance. Uh, and so the backend teams come back, say we need to plan that. And maybe two weeks or three, three weeks later, they will introduce this in their, um, their roadmap. What actually happens uh, with GraphQL is that there is a real separation, real uh, lack of adherence between the front and the back end teams because, uh, well, front end guys can query whatever they need. So, some quick facts. So, what we said is GraphQL is a strongly typed hierarchical protocol which actually defines business objects of your enterprise and it offers introspection and simplifies, or even you could say, remove versioning. Um, so usually there's way more problems than GraphQL it actually solves. It's, it, re, it introduces a probable data fetching. It will solve the, the problem with so with overfetching, underfetching, and, and reduces by this, the, the, the network request. But it also brings flexibility to the static nature of APIs. You don't, you don't uh, really have this uh, multiple endpoints, the front-end teams can make queries and can adapt the results. Uh, and it's very easy to versioning, which is really complicated and rest. And you can also stitch, stitch several schemas together. We'll see that later. So you can actually build a way more complex application. You also have some boost on performance and subscription, easy, etc. So what actually also it also does, it simplifies the back-end work because you can really hide all the complexity of your IT infrastructure for the consumers. Imagine you had this book and the price of the book can actually go through a resolver and call SIP and the stock can go to Oracle and, uh, and the comments can, can be loaded from Discuss. So this is the way um, you actually uh, simplify the backend work too, because instead of uh, working on multiple queries and, and writing multiple middleware and, and, and in the API gateway, you actually write very simple resolvers and let the front end and then let the GraphQL deal with all this front end variation. Um, it's also very flexible for front end developers. They can use queries with basic inputs, with default values, with multiple arguments. Uh, you can mix them with input types and custom scalars. You can really very easily uh, um, adapt the, your API for the 
for a multiple uh, fronted variation and duration screens. Um, one of the important things when you start doing GraphQL is to decide how you go. Is it schema first? So you decide the schema first or the code first. So you build the schema out the, of the code of your application. We really strongly suggest you to go the schema first approach. And you'll see why. This is because using GraphQL and the schema first approach, you can actually create the graph of your company. And this is something extremely important. Let's have a look over a classical architecture for your company. So you have this backend uh, big application like ERP, resource management, CRM, PIM, product information management, e-commerce website, or wholesale management, etc. And then you usually add an API gateway or a development portal that will add some security and access level. And then you have these consumer apps. And what actually happens here is you will create silos and each application developer will have to understand independently different APIs provided by ERP, CRM, PIM, and ECO. And if you want, and what usually happens, is mixing the result between these. Well, um, why, how we build API so far or inside this application, it's a way of either access data, so you build an API to access data inside an application, or a way to interact with an existing app. So you want, for example, to create a customer inside a CRM, and usually designed by developers of the backend system. And it represents the API, that it designed it this way, represent their point of view of the world, which is not always correct. Um, which may result in a spaghetti API uh, where each data structure change will induce API change. Each new feature inside an app will induce API change. And each misunderstanding between backend, uh, from backend developers over the, their view of the, AP, of the world will induce API change. And over time, it creates a spaghetti of API endpoints, difficult to maintain, messy documentation, and unbearable governance issues. Uh, it starts to be very complicated to, uh, to, to maintain a common language inside your company. So, well, well developers implementing uh, your API uh, will have to understand the data relation across backend systems. Back systems. Why does it mean, for example, a client? What does it mean a client inside ERP? What does it mean have a client inside a CRM? What does it mean a client inside your e-commerce? They are all named clients and they all have relationships. Some of the part of the data are inside CRM, part of the data are inside ERP. It cannot be solved by documentation, developer portal or API gateways. Uh, so, what you can, uh, they can, um, they have to learn the call flow logics and data structure of internal system. Um, and else it starts to be very difficult to ask complicated questions. For example, give me all authors of bad reviews of product ordered in the last months uh, from a warehouse in Hong Kong. It's really complicated to get the answers to that kind of question through the APIs. So once you introduce GraphQL, you actually create a graph oriented architecture. What does it change? You create a centralized, uh, federated global schema, GraphQL schema of your company. So all the types, uh, all the queries are stitched together, together to create a global overview of uh, of your company, of the objects, of the business objects you manipulate. And this is the responsibility of uh, of your graph graph governance team. So you what you get then with this, you have a common machine validated language of the entire company. It's your ubiquitous language of your company. You get the fastest innovation. New apps contribute to the graph. Everybody contributes to this graph and there is no versioning pain. And you also enable the most important, you enable the cross-domain silo queries you can easier ask the right, right questions. This is how you enable innovation using the graph and GraphQL ultimately. Um, some, because we are running out of time, um, what we should do, 
how you should enable that? Well, start with the usage instead of letting the backend guys and, and saying, this is my data or this is my app and this is how the API will look. Start with the usage. Like UX for developers, go front and first approach. The needs will create the API, the consumers will create the API. And then set up a schema governance team, not an API governance and schema API, uh, schema governance teams are way more uh, into business rather than the API guys. They decide what is a client, what we put commonly centralized in a central way, what is a client for my entire company, how it should look like, what the fields are, what the mandatory, what are the mutation authorized, etc. And finally, because it's so complicated to make it global, create a domain related schema, for example, um, the, the, the commerce guys will create their uh, schema and the finance guy will create their schema. And finally, probably the product team will create their own schema. And then you can stitch the schema together uh, using a federation or, or schema stitching. And this is really powerful. You can assemble like Lego bricks all the schema together to represent the entire graph of your company. And uh, one of the most important things when you design this GraphQL schema is to avoid design that will break this change in the future. It's easy to say, way more complicated to accomplish, but um, here are some very, very few tips. Uh, using object types means that this create new types instead of simple fields whenever it's possible. It's better to have, for example, um, uh, duration as an object rather than a date uh, uh, field. So as much as possible, use object type because you can always change and, and deprecate object types. You cannot do, you cannot do that with with simple scalars. So the more types and the more nested objects you have, the better it is. Um, and and as a very important tip, so after developing numerous schemas with very big companies and banks use descriptive, very precise object types. Do not try to generalize immediately. You can always interface this later. For example, it's better to talk about GraphQL Europe conference than call it just conference, because conference may be so many things. Um, and some another um, implementation tips. So you have introspection. You don't really need documentation inside your, your GraphQL. Uh, schema. This is the power of GraphQL. Uh, you can ask the server what is inside, what is the schema, how it works, and the server will re uh, return a response. Um, authentication. Uh, this is one of the common uh, complicated things in, in GraphQL. Usually you can do it very classical, post authentication, get the token and send it through all the GraphQL operations. Not a problem. Authorization very big complicated problem usually done inside the backend system you if you uh, master graphql and you start to really be in, in into graphql you can add this inside the resolvers um so to sum up graphql is a real contract strongly typed between the application that can be verified by machines over uh, and offers a strict control over exposed data um so you had some practical use cases. You can use it as a uh, gateway between your backend and your front end. You can run it as a gateway, GraphQL gateway, for over your REST API and different other backend system. You can, as we said, use it as a federation mode uh, to federate microservices together, or even use it to migrate uh, from your existing mainframe. Um, um, just, just an example, this is how it uh, was run in Expedia. Uh, Expedia, a very big company, they actually use both schema federation and 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 they have one single graph for the entire needs. And Expedia needs are very very big. They use a lot of uh, backend application for traveling. Um, I will bypass this very very quickly. You will get the anyway. You will get the the, the slides. I think after the presentation. Um, just a few words about GraphQL portal. Uh, and so this is the open source project uh, I was running and I'm running. Uh, if you want to go get into GraphQL, you can use it. GraphQL portal is an API gateway that automatically builds for you on top of your existing uh, backend systems, whatever it be, REST, SOAP, whatever it, the protocol, 
we automatically can build um, GraphQL endpoint and manage authentication, caching, all the complicated parts for you. So just download it, um, put us, give us a star on GitHub if you can. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and enjoy GraphQL. That's the, the, all the purpose of, of this, um, um, this beautiful project. Uh, and if you need some uh, consulting or expertise over GraphQL, ping us, we can help. So thank you. Uh, I think I'm just right of, uh, in time for um, for the questions. Sorry, I was on mute. Okay, thanks, thanks, Max. So uh, it's it's a full shift from rest to graph, uh, I guess. Uh, yes. But yeah, so. Uh, you did call schema governance team, not API governance team. Can you expand yeah. a bit more on that? Um, yeah. Um, so the, what API governance team does is just to avoid um, what kind of endpoints we publish, who will access to these endpoints. And it's, it's, uh, it's more uh, about what kind of APIs we publish and uh, we authorize, what kind of application could publish. So it's more like we have this catalog of existing backend systems that are uh, potentially uh, usable, what we publish to our standard way. In the graph um, governance team, it's more like what business objects as a business team, as a business we manipulate and how we present them. So it's way more business-oriented work and way more uh, related to the real reality of the business rather than just APIs and technical stuff and application interconnection. This is the main difference I see. Yeah. So is it is it still more system analyst modelers working along with business to define those objects? Is Absolutely. It? Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Cool. Thanks, Max, for your for your presentation and in, insightful talk. I, I'm definitely going to go and jump on to look into your uh, GraphQL project and will recommend for my team too. Thank yeah. you. Bye -bye. <laughs> Once again, thanks. Thanks, Bye. Max. Bye.